So uh, if you want to skip ahead to, you know, maybe question 10 or 11, if you found those difficult, then um, you can just skip through it by all means. Um, do, do what you want, basically, but this will have all the solutions walked and talked through. Um, hopefully I won't talk too much, but uh, let's get into it. So, question one. Diagram shows cross-section of a solid prism. The length of the prism is two meters. So it says cross-section of a solid prism cross-section of a solid prism which means this is a 3d shape if that helps you if, if me making it 3d like this helps then allow that to help you so remember it is a two meter long two meters deep that's how deep this shape goes prism is made out of metal the density of the metal eight grams per centimeter cube work out the mass of the prism all right now first thing there is a formula triangle which you may have picked up in physics um, if you haven't, um, then there it is. Density equals mass divided by volume. Don't marry Vera. Okay? She's not a good girl. She's not good for you. Don't marry Vera. Now, um, I need, in order to work out the density, oh, sorry, the mass, I need to know the density and I need to know the volume. I know the density. It's 8. I don't know the volume. So let's work out the volume of this prism. The way you work out the volume is, uh, so volume of a 3D shape is area of cross-section multiplied by depth so uh, and this is a non-calculator paper yeah cool um, and they want it in centimeters cubed so this two meters I'm going to straight away write down as 200 centimeters cubed uh, sorry 200 centimeters I'll need that later now area of cross-section well that is the area of this face now this face, I hope you can see, can be cut like that into 2 times 7, 14, and 5 times 2, 10. So it's 24 centimeters squared. That is the area of the face. Now I'm going to times that by 2 meters or 200 centimeters, which gives me 48 and 2 zeros centimeters cubed. Congratulations. Next step. To work out the mass, I have to do uh, density times volume. So 4,800 multiplied by 8. And uh, that will give me, without a calculator, Mr. Sheikh, good luck with that. Uh, let's do it like this instead. Uh, 8 times 0, 8 times 0, 8 times 8, 64, 8 times 4, 32, plus 6 is 38. So that is 38,400 grams. 38,400 grams, or if you prefer, uh, in kilograms, that is divided by a thousand. Kilo, by the way, means a thousand. That is 38.4 kg. Boom. 38.4 kg. All right. Moving swiftly on. Question two. Dylan's driving from London to Newcastle. He will drive a total distance of 240 miles. Dylan leaves at 9.30 takes him one and a half hours to travel 90 miles uses information to estimate estimate what time he arrives in Newcastle you must show how you get your answer okay well uh, I need to first work out his speed uh, what time is, yeah so I need to first work out his speed so I'm just gonna write this formula triangle down okay already two formula triangles only had two questions so speed equals distance divided by time now um, it took him one and a half hours to travel 90 miles so 90 so the speed is equal to 90 miles divided by one and a half um, you can write that as 1.5 um, uh, or alternatively you could even do it as minutes would that be helpful hmm. yeah let's do it as minutes one and a half hours is uh, 60 plus 30 minutes yeah which is 90 minutes so 90 divided by 90 is 1. So what I've just worked out is that this guy, Dylan, is traveling at 1 mile per minute, which is, uh, which is pretty fast. But cool. 1 mile a minute. Now, 60 miles an hour if you prefer, but anyway. Uh, 1 mile per minute. And I'm estimating how long he arrives, how, uh, the time he arrives in Newcastle. Well, if he left at uh, 9.30, and I've just worked out it's going to take him a mile a minute, 240 miles will take, yes, you guessed it, 240 minutes. 
Uh, what is that in hours, Mr. Sheikh? Divide it by 60. Three, no, that's really good that you're a math teacher. Four hours. Okay, so four hours. And um, if he leaves at 9.30, here's where we can check if Mr. Sheikh can tell the time. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 1.30. He arrives at 1.30 p.m. Or 13.30 if you prefer that clock. Done. Next, write down one assumption you made in your answer to part A. Uh, okay, assumption. So the assumption I made is that his first 90 miles are representative of the whole journey. So assumption, um, first 90 miles speed applied to entire journey. Okay, so that is what I've assumed. Um, and if your assumption is wrong, how would this affect your answer? So, could be longer or shorter if uh, his average speed is um, slower or faster than 60 mph. So what I've effectively done here guys um, is I've worked out that his average speed is a mile per minute or 60 miles an hour and then I've worked out if it was 60 miles an hour for the whole journey 240 miles uh, that would take him a total of, um, of four hours and therefore he arrives at 1.30. However, the assumption, as I've said, is um, that this first bit of the journey represents the entire journey. So, you know, as you and I know, when I say you and I, it's like I'm talking to one person, as you should all be aware, sometimes, you know, you, you travel on the motorway and the motorway part of the journey is quicker. You can, you know, travel down the M6, 10 junctions, that might be, I don't know, 70 miles, and you've done that in like 40 minutes. But then that last bit, which is only five miles, just getting from, you know, whatever, wherever the junction you get off, junction six, to, to, to get to your house in, in, in wherever you live in, uh, in, in, in Washwood Heath, um, that bit of the journey is only a few miles from junction six to Washwood Heath, um, but it takes quite a long time because you're not on the motorway. On the motorway, you go a lot faster on A roads and B roads, unless you're a rude boy. Uh, or a rude girl, um, you won't be travelling that fast. Okay, number three. Arwen <laughs> buys a car for £4,000. The value of the car depreciates 10% each year. Work out the value of the car after two years. Okay, 10% depreciation. Remember, I'm just going to write compound because compound means uh, it, uh, each year it kind of uh, affects further. So, um, she bought the car for £4,000. Um, in the first year it goes down by 10% so £4,000 uh, if we take off 10% take away 10% 10% will be £400 that leaves me with £3,600 that is now so this was year zero let's say so this is uh, year one um, I've now I'm now worth 3600 now I've got to take another 10% of this new amount so that is £360 take that off and you get £3,240 uh, and that is my value at the beginning of year 2 and that is all I wanted right work out the value of the car 2 years boom 3240 nice and simple alright so work out 10% take it off work out 10% of the new amount take it off happy birthday there you go question 4 Suha has a full 600ml bottle of wallpaper remover. She's going to mix some of the wallpaper remover with water. Here is information on the, the label. She's going to use 750ml. Uh, that's what the, mil, the bottle says. How many millimeters, milliliters of wallpaper remover should she use? Excuse me, I'm spitting on the page. Right. How many milliliters of wallpaper remover? Um, okay. Okay, uh, so it tells you how much water she's going to use, um, and they're asking you to basically figure out um, how much wallpaper remover she needs. Now, if it, it, on the label it says if you use a quarter of it, a quarter of 600 by the way, 600 divided by 4, half it, 300, half it again, 150. 
So that's what you're supposed to use. You're supposed to use it in a ratio of 150 mil to 4,500 mil water. Yeah, that's what you're supposed to use it. Uh, that's the ratio you're supposed to use, according to the label. But this lady, Suha, uh, is using 750 mil. So what you've got to say is, how do you turn 4,500 mil into 750 mil? And then once you've worked that out, you basically do the same thing on, on this side. Um, so, I mean, it's... it's I'm just thinking how best to do this. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd probably, if I were you, divide by 15. So I'm trying to, ultimately, I'm trying to turn this into 750, right? So let's uh, divide it by 15 first, because 45 comes in the 15 times table, uh, and it comes in three times. So if I divide that by 15, uh, that will give me 300 um, mil. And divide this by 15, uh, 150 divided by 15 is 10 mil. So that's the ratio, 300 to 10. Now I'm going to divide it um, by uh, 10, um, which will give me, so I'm dividing it now by 10, and dividing by 10, which gives me 1 mil of that is for 30 mil of that. Um, now, the next thing you need to really do is say, well, how do I turn 30 mil into 750 mil? Okay, so I've divided my ratio parts down. So it's one milliliter of wallpaper remover to 30 mil of water. So you have to use 30 times as much, effectively. Um, so I suppose one thing you could do, if you know she's using 750 mil of water, uh, to go from here to here, you divide by 30. So I could just divide by 30. Um, alternatively, you could look at how do you turn 30 into uh, 750, and the answer is you multiply it uh, by 25, okay? If I times that by uh, 25, it will give me 750, all right? So do the same thing on this side times that by 25 and that'll give you 25 mil. So how many milliliters of wallpaper remover should she use? 25 mil is the answer. Next question five. Uh, there are 18 packets of sweets and 12 boxes of sweets in a carton. The mean number is uh, 14. The mean number of sweets in the 18 packets is 10. Work out the mean number of sweets in the boxes. Well, all, in all the boxes, what I need is total divided by total boxes. So I should, I should have written total sweets here. So total sweets divided by total boxes. Now, if the mean number of sweets in all 30 packets and boxes all together is 14, so something divided by 30 equals 14. How can I go back to the something? What do I do to both sides? And if you're all shouting at your screens and saying times by 30, that is correct. So 14 times 30, uh, the bus stop is your friend. 0 times 4, 0 times 1 is 0. Move across, placeholder, 3 times 4, 12. 3 times 1, 3, plus 1 is 4. Uh, that's just 420. So um, 420 um, is the something at the top of the box at the top, which means uh, sweets altogether. Okay, so that's what I've just worked out. Uh, in all of them, there's 320. Now, in the packets, the mean is 18. So, at the same time as this being true, that's true. At the same time, uh, a number divided by 18 gives me 10. So, this is the total sweets in the uh, packets. So, if I times by 18 now. That will give me the total, which is 180. So I've just worked out there's 180 sweets in packets. Now, if there's 420 altogether and 180 in the packets, how many must be in the boxes? Well, 420, take away 180. Uh, borrow is... No, wait, I don't need to borrow here, stupid man. Um, borrow from here, 12 take away is 4, 3 take away is 2. So I've just worked out there's 240 in the 12 boxes. So 240, 240 sweets 
in 12 boxes. And finally, you're going to divide by 12. 240 divided by 12 uh, gives me, uh, well, 24 divided by 12 is 2, so that's 20. So the average is there are 20 uh, sweets in each box. I would first convert them all into ordinary numbers. That's the first thing I do. So uh, times by 10 squared, move the decimal place two times, that's 3.8 times by 10 to the minus 4, move it 4 places left, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0 0.38, 380, that's just 380, and that times 10 to the minus 1, move it 1 to the left, 0 0.038. So, in order of size, the smallest one is this one, so this is number 1, then after that is this one, this is number 2, then after that is this one, this is number 3, and uh -huh, is that one, number 4. So. Writing them in order of size, 0 0.38 times 10 to the minus 1, that's number 1. 3,800 times 10 to the minus 4, that's number 2. Uh, 0 0.038 times 10 squared, that's number 3. And then the biggest number was just 380. Done. Next, find the value of n such that this is true. Now, uh, indices rules tell you when you multiply, you add the powers, and when you divide, you take away the powers. So 2 to the 9 over 2 to the something makes 2 to the 5. I've just told you when you divide, you take away the power. So 9 take away something makes 5. The something has to be 4. Next, uh, this is an uh, inequality question. It says minus 6 is less than or the same as 2y, which is also less than 5. y is an integer. Write down all the numbers it could be. Well, first thing I'm going to do is divide through by 2, because if I've got 2y in the middle here, I need to Divide this side by 2 and divide that side by 2. So divide all the way through by 2. That gives me minus 3, smaller than, same as 1y, smaller than 2.5. Now, it, wants, it says it's an integer. Define integer. Integer means whole number. So I need to choose a number that is um, bigger than minus 3 or equal to and less than two and a half. So it can't be two and a half because that is not an integer. The first number less than two and a half is a two. So let's just go through the list then. So minus three could be that, could be minus two, could be minus one, could be zero, could be one, could be two, can't be three because three is bigger than that. So you don't write three. You just go from minus three up to two. Next question eight. x and y are two numbers, each of which are greater than 3. The highest common factor of x and y is 3. The lowest common multiple of x and y is 36. Find x and y. Oh, sorry. There it is. Um, yeah, interesting question. I mean, I've seen lots of different methods for this. Uh, some of you do it with a Venn diagram. Um, Personally, I'm probably a fan of trial and error in this case. Let me just read the number question again. Greater than three. The highest common factor is, is is three. Okay. Uh, excuse me. LTM is thirty-six. All right. Um, so you're thinking of two numbers that have uh, that come in uh, that have thirty-six in their times table, and they both come in the three times table. So. Uh, in the three times table, you've got three, six, uh, nine, twelve. 15, 18, 21, etc. And um, uh, and uh, which of these numbers in their own times tables have 36 in it? Well, this does, this does, this does, this does, that doesn't, that does, that doesn't. So there's like already in the first few, you've got uh, five different numbers that do have, that do come in the, th uh, that do have 36 in, the, in their time table. So it is a question really of, I guess, uh, of, of trying. Um, so uh, you know that it can't be 3 and one of the numbers because it's got to be bigger than 3. So for example, uh, 6 and 9, let's look at that. If it was 6 and 9, well, if I got my 6 times table, I've got 12, uh, I've got 18. I've got 24, I've got 30, and I've got 36. I've got my 9 times table, I've got 9, 18. So straight away, the lowest common multiple is 18, and it's meant to be 36, so it can't be those two. So let's try um, 9 and 12 instead then. 9 and 12, 
So it's not that one, so I'll put cross there. Let's try 9 and 12. If I go up my 9 times table, uh, I've got 9, I've got 18, um, I've got uh, 27, 36, 45, etc. Got 12 times table, you got 12, uh, you got uh, 24, and you got 36. So LCM, yep. HCF, well, the highest number that goes into both of these numbers is 3. So hey, there you go, 9 and 12. Boom. Uh, enlarge triangle T by scale factor a half, center 2, 0. So let's put a cross on uh, 2, 0. And when a question says uh, enlarge T by a scale factor of a half, what that means is look at the distance from here to here, each point on your shape, and then half it. So, for example, to get from uh, my center of enlargement to this point here, I have to go two across and I have to go four up. Half that half those distances. So instead of going two across and four up, I'm going to go one across and two up. There. And again, from here to here, I'd go four across, four up, but instead of going four across, I go two across. Instead of going four up, I go two up. And finally, from here up to this point, I'd go two across and I'd go eight up, which is going to become one across and four up. And there is my new triangle. Does it ask me to label it? No, it doesn't. But I'm going to label it anyway. So I'm going to label this triangle as, I don't know, S. So uh, Q, T, Q, uh, Q, R, S, T. All right, so uh, that is the new triangle. It is half the size and it is half the distance from here. So I looked at how to get from there to there and then I halved it. Okay. Question. Oh, wonderful histogram. Okay, so a histogram requires you to add a column on, uh, which we call frequency density. And uh, the frequency density is uh, basically, it's the frequency divided by the class width. So frequency density, frequency divided by class width. What is class width, Mr. Sheikh? Well, class width, uh, guys, is how wide these bars are. Sorry, you can't see the formula triangle. There you go. Um, how wide these bars are. So for the frequency density of the first one, 15 divided by 5, basically. Okay, so I, I, what I'll do is I'll write that over here. 15 uh, divided by 5. For this one, it's going to be uh, 25 divided by the distance there, 5. For this one, it's going to be 36 divided by the distance here is 10. And for this one, it's going to be 24 divided by the distance here is 20. And the, yes, this is a non-calculated question. So before people start moaning about, oh, but sir, how do I do 20, what do I do 20? Yeah, you got to do it. All right, 15 divided by 5, 3. 25 divided by 5, 5. 36 divided by 10, 3.6. Not that hard. 24 divided by 20, maybe a little bit harder. Uh, if it helps, treat it like a fraction and simplify the fraction. So uh, that would be 12 over 10. Uh, and straight away, I mean, that's 1.2, so I'm going to write it, but you could carry on simplifying it. Does that help? 6 over 5? Yeah, 1.2, if you can do bus stop, but yeah, 1.2. All right, next, um, look at your uh, uh, scale. You need, it needs to go up to 5 is the biggest frequency density. So I'm just going to look at this scale uh, and check that it goes up nicely to uh, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All right, that's convenient. So uh, that goes up to there. I'm going to call that frequency density 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So every 10 squares is 1. Therefore, every little box, little tiny box is 0 0.1. All right, then. First bar, 60 to 65. 60 to 65. So I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 boxes across. And it goes up to 3. So with a ruler... And uh, really, you should use a pencil for this, Mr. Shake. You should model exactly what you expect from your students. Yes, you should. Here is a pencil. Really, you should use a sharp pencil, but I'm not uh, going to stop recording. Just going to get a sharpener. Um, there and there. Maybe pencil is not such a good idea because you can barely see that, can you? 
Well, let's see. I might shade it in later. All right, next one. 65 to 70 is 5. 65 to 70 needs to go up to 5. There it is. 5 and 5 and... Oh, that was a really badly drawn line. I just realized. Sorry. But there's your top bar there. Um, again, sorry if still got to see. Next one, 70 to 80, 3.6. 70 to 80, 3. Now, 3.6. Okay, so remember what I said. Each box is 0 0.1. So 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6. Just here. Here. Okay. So that needs to go across to the 80 line. So there is 3.6 and there is 80. Next. Uh, from 80 to 100, 1.2. So 1.1, 1.2, 80 to 100, 1.2. There it is. Okay, now it's not perfect. Um, well, I mean, I don't want to say that it's perfect because I feel like that's a little bit boastful, but um, it, it, it's going to get you full marks. The only reason I don't like it is because it's hard on the video perhaps to see these lines very clearly. Um, the only thing I might do is shade it in. So if I just shade in the first bar like that and shade in the other bar in the contrary direction, maybe that will help you to see it. If you can't see it, I apologize. Um, but um, yeah, I'm kind of new to this whole video business, so let's see how that works. Okay, uh, work out an estimate for the number of cars with a speed of more than 85 miles per hour, kilometers per hour. Sorry. Right, so I'm going to go back to pen for this. 85 kilometers per hour on my grid is here. Uh, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85. There. This is what I'm talking about. This part of my um, uh, histogram, okay? Now the thing about a histogram, and I want you to write this, well, I'm gonna write it, you can uh, remember it. Histogram, area equals frequency. So unlike with a bar chart, because you know with a bar chart, um, the, the height of the bar tells you how much frequency there is. With a uh, histogram, it's the area of the bar. So what I basically got to do for this, guys, is to work out the area of this green bit of the bar. Excuse me. So uh, pretty much uh, does what it says on the tin. That is a rectangle, and I'm working out the area of this rectangle, yeah? Now the base of it is from 85 to 100, 15. The height of it is, on that scale, 1.2. 15 times 1.2. 15 times 1.2. Uh, perhaps not the easiest thing to do without a calculator, but I mean, there's like a million ways you could do it. So I could do 10 times 1.2 and 5 times 1.2 and add them together. So that's 12 and 6. Add it together. 18. There you go. 18. Oh, sorry. Uh, move it down a bit. Okay. Uh, question 12. Um, I'm going to do question 12 um, and then I'm going to. Um, pause or take a break. So question 12. Um, x squared plus 3x minus 4. So let's factorize. Oh, simplify fully. Uh, my hint is always uh, factorize, then cancel, oh, cancel a bracket. Now, I mean, this comes from experience, guys. Like, um, you know, obviously I, I teach this. This is my job. I'm meant to know this. You guys uh, with less experience won't, but I'm telling you, as somebody who does this every day, this always involves factorizing. And then usually you'll have a bracket on the top that's the same as the bracket on the bottom. And as you should know, if you've got something on the top and the bottom, you can cancel it out. So we'll factorize the top. Factorize the top gives me uh, x plus 4 and x minus 1. If you don't know how to factorize, go and watch the video on it. And factorizing the bottom gives me 2x and x, and I want, it's going to be 3 and 1, so it's looking like that, okay? Now, uh, looking at those two, you've got one bracket the same here and here, so final answer, x plus 4 over 2x minus 3, done. Next one, write this as a single fraction in simplest form. So uh, single fraction, this is cross and smile. Just like if you had a fraction uh, with different denominators, I don't know, like uh, one third add two fifths, you would do that times that, 
which is 5, and then do that times that, which is 6, and then you'd write an add, and then you do 3 times 5, which is the smile, which is 15. Answer 11 over 15. It's pretty much the same thing. I'll leave that in a bubble, uh, but it's got some funky algebra, but it's the same thing. So that times that, which is 4 lots of x minus 2, that times that, which is 3 lots of x plus 2, it's a plus in the middle, so a plus in the middle, and then at the bottom, that times that. Smile x plus 2 times x minus 2. Now expand and collect the terms. Expanding 4x minus 8 plus 3x plus 6 over expanding x squared minus 2x plus 2x. That's going to cancel out. Minus 4. Final answer then. 4x plus 3x, 7x minus 8 plus 6 minus 2 and cancels x squared minus 4. Final answer. It says this diagram shows a solid hemisphere radius 5. Find the total surface area of the solid hemisphere. Give your answer in terms of pi. Now the reason they've said give it in terms of pi is because you don't have a calculator so you can't uh, actually work this out uh, accurately. Uh, well you can't work it out sorry as a decimal because Multiplying by pi without a calculator is difficult. So all you're going to do is use this formula um, using 5 as r. But remember, this is half a sphere. Yeah, That is the surface area of a full sphere. This is a hemisphere. Hemisphere means half. Hemisphere, half a sphere. So I'm going to do 4 times pi times 5 squared. And then I just have to remember at the end to divide it by 2. Uh, so that's 4 times pi times 25 divided by 2. 4 times 25 is 100. So that's 100, oh, excuse me, 100 pi divided by 2. So that's 50 pi. Nice and easy so far. Now what you've got to remember, uh, year 11, is that you've also got this circle at the bottom because they want the total surface area. What I've just worked out is the surface area. If it was a sphere, that would just be this curved part. Or, or you know a full sphere if I drew the rest of it that would be the whole of the ball right the whole of the of the, of the sphere but I've got half a, a sphere which I've got there 50 pi plus this area at the bottom if I just sort of shade in this area here which is just a circle if you think about what I'm looking at there that's just a circle so I've got 50 pi plus the area of a circle now you should all know the area of a circle is pi times r squared um, okay so pi times 5 squared which is 25 pi so I've got 50 pi that's the curved part 25 pi all together 75 pi nothing too complicated there um, that's question 13 question 14 there are 20 counters in the bag 8 are yellow 12 are green Asif takes 2 at random, work out the probability, probability of the two different colours. So this is a probability tree question. Probability tree. And there are two options, yellow or green. So first pick, first pick, you can get a yellow or you can get a green. Uh, 8 out of 20 versus 12 out of 20, 20 altogether. Now second pick, second pick, if I could spell that would be good. Uh, second pick is going to be you've got a second pick here and a second pick here now again you've got yellow or green yellow or green now because it says he doesn't replace them it's really important here it doesn't talk about replacing these things so the denominator is not 20 anymore if I took a yellow one the first time well all the denominators are going to now be 19 if I took a green one again the denominator is going to be 19 now because there's only 19 left um, then, if I took a yellow one the first time, how many yellow ones are left in there now? There were eight. If I took one of those out, there's only seven left. And uh, green, well, if I took a yellow one the first time, there are still 12 green ones left. So 12 out of 19 there. You can check by adding the numerators together, 12 add 7, and it makes 19, so I'm happy. And then the second uh, uh, branch, 12... If I took a green one the first time, there's now only 11 green ones left. If I took a green one the first time, then there would be 8 yellow ones in there, if I took the green. So these are my, this is my completed tree. Now you'll get two marks for the tree. Now, 
looking at the second and third parts of the, the second and third lines, uh, he's taken two at random, so that times that, that times that. Work out the probability two different colours. So what I tend to do, what my, my maths teacher in, uh, in year 10 taught me, is to uh, write down your outcomes at the end. So I'm going to write yellow, yellow here, yellow, green here, green, yellow here, and green, green. These are all the outcomes. And the question says, work out the probability that they're different colours. So there's only two outcomes I'm interested in yellow green and green yellow I don't care about yellow yellow I don't care about green green now to work out those probabilities you have to multiply along the tree I'm gonna write that multiply along the tree so here we go 8 out of 20 times by 12 out of 19 8 out of 20 times 12 out of 19 and then for the green yellow that would be 12 out of 20 times by 8 out of oh, sorry 19 uh, and now you're just gonna do those uh, those two sums I'm just gonna move this down a bit so I can make some space uh, 8 times 12 is 96 so 96 out of 20 times 19 um, this is by the way yellow green I'm doing here uh, 96 and 28 times 19 I probably do just to play it safe uh, excuse me if I could multiply properly. Uh, I'll probably do the column multiplication. So 9 times 0 is nothing. 9 times 2 is 18. When I move across, you need a placeholder down here. 1 times 0 is nothing. 1 times 2 is 2. Add it together and you've got 380. So 96 out of 380, that's yellow green. Now if I do green yellow, that is, well, the same at the top, 96. And actually the same at the bottom, 20 times 19, 380. Now the, the last thing to do, when you uh, do a probability tree, you multiply along the trees and you add, when you've got your, your two answers, so I've just worked it out, 96 out of 380 and 96 out of 380, I now have to add these two together. Now when you add fractions that have the same denominator, you just have to add the numerators. So 96 add 96 is 180, 192 and out of 380 and that will be my final answer there 192 out of 380 question 14 done question 15 so this is a proof question okay algebraic proof so I'm just gonna write that at the top uh, I haven't done a video on this on YouTube algebraic uh, proof uh, this is we're heading towards the sort of grade 7 and above questions now so we're getting into the harder part of the higher paper this is really, I think, set one um, exclusively from here onwards. I mean, set two, we'll be able to have to have a go at many of these questions, but from 15 onwards, we're starting to get into the harder, harder questions. Excuse me. So, <clears throat> use algebra to show that that plus that is always an even number. So let's um, work this out. N squared minus one. Well, that is already as it is, n squared minus 1. Now, n minus 1 squared, that is this. When you square a bracket, you're multiplying the bracket by itself, okay? So, n times n, that's n squared. n times minus 1, that's minus 1n. Minus 1 times n, that's minus another 1n. And minus 1 times minus 1, that's plus uh, 1. So, collect all of this together. You've got um, n squared plus n squared, that's 2n squared. Minus 1 and plus 1, they cancel each other out, cancel out, and minus 1n minus another n is minus 2n. Now the last step is to be able to prove or to show that that is an even number. Now think to yourself for a minute, how do you define even number? When somebody says to you, or when a teacher says to you back when you were in primary school, how do you know something's even? Uh, you'd probably say because it comes in the two times table. Okay, great. So how would I prove that something's in the two times table? Well, hopefully now at this stage of, uh, of your education, you'll be able to turn around and say, well, it's in the two times table if two is a factor. Now, looking at these two, these two terms, is two a factor of those two terms? And the answer is yes. So I can factor two out of this, leaving me with n squared minus n. And then I'm just going to write, therefore, um, because 2 is a factor, because 2 is a factor, uh, 2n squared minus 2n must 
be uh, even. And that's it. So because 2 is a factor, it's got to be an even number. Okay, so question 16 says uh, this is an equilateral triangle. D lies on BC. AD is perpendicular to BC. Prove that it is congruent. ADC, ADC is congruent to ADB. Now, triangle proof questions. Uh, there's there's four different ways you can uh, you can prove this. Um, I'm not going to go through all four because uh, that's not the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video is to just give you a walkthrough for this paper. So for this reason, this uh, example, we're looking for the following. RHS, which stands for uh, right angle, um, hypotenuse, and side. So what you've got to be able to prove is that they both have a right angle and uh, a, a hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is the same as the other hypotenuse. And that one side, one other side, is equal. So, uh, and that's the, the, the rule that I'm going to use to prove that triangle 1 is the same as triangle 2. So uh, let's go through uh, that then. So, triangle uh, 1. Now, I know that there's a right angle because if, as they've told you, AD is perpendicular, this is a right angle on this side and this is a right angle on this side, okay? So I'm going to write um, um, AD perpendicular to BC, therefore uh, angle D is a right angle. Okay, so that's the first, uh, the first thing. Next, uh, hypotenuse. Now, I know that the hypotenuse, the hypotenuse in, in triangle 1 is this, this side, H, and the hypotenuse in this triangle is this side, H. I know that they're the same because the first line, equilateral. What do you know about equilateral triangles? That's equal to that, equal to that. So, I'm going to write AB is equal to AC uh, because... Um, ABC is equilateral so that is the second one done so right angle proven hypotenuse proven now the side now the side I'm going to choose uh, to prove I could I could prove BD equal to DC but it's more complicated it's far easier to just use line AD how do I know that AD is the same in that one and that one well because it's the same line that line there is involved in this triangle and it's also involved in this triangle. So AD um, equal to AD, and I'm just going to write in brackets shared. And then I'm going to write, therefore, uh, both triangles are congruent. Uh, both triangles are congruent. Um, and then I'll put in brackets RHS. That's the rule I've used. Right angle, hypotenuse, and one of the sides. So I've just proven that is the case. Uh, part. Uh, so for part B, uh, what you've got to do now is hence prove that BD, this line here, is half of AB. Now again, uh, you can prove this uh, straight away. You can say that BD is half of BC uh, and the reason that BD is half of BC is because you've just proven that triangle 1 is identical to triangle 2 so therefore this has been cut in half BC is cut in half to give me these two lines BD and DC so BD is half of BC uh, because um, ABD is congruent congruent means identical by the way uh, to A, D, C um, and then um, <clears throat> uh, you need to write that A, B is uh, equal to B, C uh, sorry, yeah, A, A, B this line here is equal to B, C this line here uh, because in brackets I'm just going to write my reason uh, because it's an equilateral triangle equilateral triangle 
Um, so uh, by that logic, if BD is half of BC, it's also going to be half of AB because BC is the same as AB. So therefore, BD is half of BC, which is, means it's also half of AB. Okay, because BC is the same as AB. So if it's half of that, it's got to be half of that as well. Sorry, I'll move that up. I'll just repeat that again. So BD um, is half of BC. That's the thing I said at the start. And because it's half of BC, it must also be half of AB as well. Okay. That is question 16. Done. Question 17, rationalizing denominator. So to rationalize, that means you need to remove third from denominator that's what this means denominator now the way to remove this third is to multiply it by something over itself now if i multiply it by root 5 over root 5 whenever i do something divided by itself that's the same as 1 so i'm effectively times in this fraction by 1 but um, it will get rid of the third at the bottom have a look 6 times root 5 is 6 root 5 Root 5 times root 5 is root 25, which is 5. So 6 root 5 over 5. And I've now rationalized that third. If I put that in a calculator, and I put that in a calculator, it will say the same thing. Okay? This is equal to this. Uh, all I've done is I've times it by 1. Okay? So I'm just going to draw an arrow to that and say that that is the same as me timesing it by 1. Uh, so it hasn't changed the value. It just changed how it looks. Uh, finally then, uh, 617 part B, expand and simplify, so expand and simplify, so this is 2 root 5 plus uh, 2 root 20 plus root 50 plus root 200. So I've just done FOIL, first, outside, inside, last, and now I'm going to uh, collect some terms except I can't collect any terms because at the moment these are all um, not simplified thirds so 2 root 5 is fine but I can simplify 2 root 20 I'm gonna do these one at a time actually that's probably the simplest way to do it so taking these one at a time uh, 2 root 20 well root 20 I can rewrite as root 4 times root 5 so 2 times the square root of 4 what's the square root of 4 2, so 2 times 2 times root 5, that's 4 root 5. So I've just turned this into this. Okay, so that's the 2 root 20 done. So I'm going to rewrite that as 4 root 5. Now we're going to deal with root 50. Well, root 50 is the same as me writing uh, root 25 times by root 2. What's the square root of 25? 5. So that is 5 root 2. So I've just simplified that one. And then root 200, well, that is the same as me writing root, uh, sorry, 200, sorry, uh, root 100 times by root 2, which is, what's the square root of 100? 10. So 10 root 2. I've just simplified each of those thirds. That one, that one, and that one are all simplified now. Now I'm going to write them all in a row again. So I've got 2 root 5. That was already simple. This one I've rewritten. This one is 5 root 2. And this one is 10 root 2. Now collect together. So 2 root 5 plus five, uh, 4 root 5 is 6 root 5. 5 root 2 plus 10 root 2 is 15 root 2. And that is my answer to this question. So the answer to this question, 6 root 5 plus 15 root 2. Okay. Um, question 18. Construct the graph of x squared plus y squared equals 9. Now, I'm straight away going to draw an arrow to this and draw uh, and just write down graph of a circle. Now, uh, it's, a, it's a type of, it's a specific type of graph, okay? Uh, whenever you see a, a question like this, x squared plus y squared equals something, that's going to be a circle. Now, uh, what you've got to remember is... Um, if I write x squared plus y squared equals r squared, r is the radius of the circle. So in other words, r squared makes 9. So r squared is 9, which means that r has to be uh, plus or minus 3. So effectively, I'm going to draw a circle which has a radius of 3. Um, positive 3, 
negative 3, positive 3, negative 3. Now, um, ideally, you would use a, a compass and a, a protractor, uh, sorry, a compass and a pencil for this. So that is what I'm going to do because I'm going to model exactly how you should do this. So I'm just going to open this, um, uh, yeah, the way you line up a compass, you have to make sure the pencil and the compass are lined up. Put the point right on the zero, zero, open it up to the three, and that should line up with the three at the top as well, as long as this has been drawn accurately, yep, okay, it's been printed well. So there, I hope you can all see, is my circle. So I've just plotted um, that graph. Part B, by drawing uh, x plus y equals one on the grid, solve the equations, uh, x squared plus y squared equals 9, x plus y equals 1. What it's asking for uh, here is really for you to draw this line, draw on grid, and then look, that's not how you spell look, <laughs> look at intersections. Okay, so uh, let's do that. First, I'm going to rearrange this because you guys are used to seeing graphs, uh, linear graphs looking like this y equals mx plus c. So I'm going to move the x onto the other side um, for this second line. I'll just deal with it down here. So y equals 1 minus x. Now if we just do a quick table of values for this, nice and quick, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do too too many, uh, x and y, uh, I don't know, we'll go from minus 2 to 2, let's say minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1 and 2. So 1 take away x, 1 take away minus 2, double negative, that becomes 1 plus 2, which is 3. 1 take away minus 1, double negative, that's 2. 1 take away nothing is 1. 1 take away 1 is 0. 1 take away 2, minus 1. So I've just uh, done a table of values. Now I'm going to plot those points. Minus 2 and 3 is here. Minus 1 and 2 is here. 0 and, sorry if you can't see that, 0 and 1 is here. 1 and 0 is here. 2 and minus 1 is here, so hopefully you can now see um, those points. I'm going to draw a straight line crossing through all of those, which is just there. Uh, so that's step 1 done. Now just look at the two intersections. So there are two places they cross. 1, 2. And they want you to estimate or solve those equations. So basically tell me where they, they cross over. So I'll look at this one first. Um, unfortunately I can't zoom in. Um, with this 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 uh, visualizer software um, so you just have to bear with me while we look at this carefully so that looks like uh, 2.6 to me 2.6 there and the y value uh, let's call it minus 1 point well 1.55 if we're being really accurate um, minus 1.55 there minus 1 minus 1.5 this is halfway between minus 1.5 and 1.6 so that's one solution so I'll write that one in 2.6 on the X and minus 1.55 on the Y and the second solution we'll look at this one now so on the uh, X axis it's right there which is on uh, minus 1.6 and on the Y axis it's pretty much bang on 2.6 so uh, Mm, 2.6 and minus 1.6 okay so you've got your four solutions okay there are two places they cross x and y coordinate and x and y coordinate okay question uh, 19 next p is inversely proportional to v when v is 8 p is 5 find a formula for p in terms of v Inversely proportional. So uh, you may remember if, if I said that something was proportional. So if I say that A is proportional to B, then you write A and then this fish symbol, or the squiggly line, B. And you replace the squiggly line with equals K. So A equals KB. Okay. And then what you'll do is you'll substitute A and B for the numbers they give you and work out K. But when it says, as in this case, P is inversely proportional to V, then you write P, squiggly line, um, 1 over 
v. Okay, so inverse proportion is you start. That's your starting point. Now in this case, and and then again, you replace the fish with equals k. So p equals k over v. Uh, so here we go then. I'm going to write p equals k over v, and then I'm going to substitute in v and p. So 5 equals uh, something divided by 8. Now, to work out the something, I'm going to times by 8 and times by 8, both sides. That gives me that k equals 40. So, back to our original formula. This is our original, remember. P equals something, I've just worked it out, divided by V. So that's my formula, 40 over V. And then it says calculate the value of P when V is 2. So I'm just going to substitute 2 in to that formula I just worked out. So what is P uh, when V is 2? Well, 40 divided by 2 is 20, so the answer is 20. That's question uh, 19. How many have we got left? All right, sounds the diagram shows part of the curve uh, with the equation y equals f of x. Right in the coordinates of the minimum, sorry, the minimum points of this curve are 3 minus 4. Right in the coordinates of the minimum point of the curve of the equation that. Now, what this means is 3 up, okay? So, uh, if I move up, is that affecting the y-axis or the x-axis? You should all be shouting out y-axis. So, the x is going to stay the same. The minimum point is going to stay the same x but the y value goes up by 3. So minus 4 becomes minus 1. Okay. Uh, now, if I've got uh, the function, uh, sorry, if, if uh, f of 2x, now what this does is it effectively uh, does the opposite to what you think. So what this means is 2 times the x. Okay, but what that does to all of your x values is it actually does the opposite. So instead of multiplying your x value by 2, you're going to uh, divide all x coordinates by 2. So if x used to be 4, it's now going to be 2. If x used to be 3, it's now going to be 1.5. Now the y value stays exactly the same because this only affects the x. Okay, so the y value is still going to be minus 4. And then uh, again, that does what you'd expect it to do. It changes um, the, uh, so, so basically multiply uh, x coordinates by uh, minus 1. Although I suppose I should say divide. Again, if it does the opposite to what you expect. So that says minus 1 times x. Uh, so instead of doing minus 1 times it, you divide it by minus 1. The effect is the same. 3 divided by minus 1 is minus 3. So it used to be uh, positive 3. Now I'm going to write minus 3 and uh, minus 4. All right. Question 21. The last question. All right. Question 21. A has coordinates minus 3, 0. B has coordinates 1, 6. C has coordinates 5, 2. Find the equation of the line that passes through C and is perpendicular to AB. Give your, excuse me, give your equation in the form AX plus BY equals uh, C, where AB and C are integers. All right, let's start with uh, what we can do. AB. So this means line AB. So let's work out the equation of that line. Um, I have the coordinates of A and the coordinates of B. So let's first work out the equation of that line. Now, the way to work out the equation of a line is to first work out the gradient. So M, which is the change in Y divided by the change in X. Um, so in this case, looking at these two, how has Y changed to go from A, which was, this is, uh, this is sorry, this is Y, this is X. And this is x as well. So how does it change to go from uh, minus 3 to 1? Well, that has increased by 4. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at the x. But that's fine. We'll do the x first then. So change in y divided by change in x. So the change in x I'll deal with first. Minus 3 to 1, that's gone up by 4. All right. So that's the change in x. Now the change in y from 0 to 6, it's gone up by 6. So, the change in y divided by the change in x, 6 divided by 4, simplifies 3 divided by 2, 1.5. So, I've just worked out the gradient of the line, 
this line, it's going to be y equals something x plus something. I've just worked out the something x, 1.5x. I know the gradient's 1.5. Now, for the intercept, um, I am going to substitute one of the numbers in. Now, the one I'm going to use is... Yeah, why not? Let's go with... Uh, we're going to substitute minus 3 into there. Okay? So, um, if I write down 0, because that's what y is, equals... 1.5 times minus 3, because that's what x is for point A, plus something, and that's the thing that I need to work out, then this is how I'm going to work out the something. What is 1.5 uh, times by minus 3? Uh, well, the answer to that is uh, minus 4. So now to get C on its own, I'm going to add 4, add 4, giving me... Four. So I've just worked out the equation of the line AB. So AB, the equation of that line is y equals 1.5x plus 4. That is mm, like two-thirds of the question done. The last bit then is to, well, I say two-thirds, maybe half of the question done. Uh, the last bit then is to work out the equation of the line that passes through C and is perpendicular to AB. So, uh, what I'm going to do actually is rewrite that as a fraction, because you may find it easier in a minute. Now, perpendicular gradient would be minus 1 over m. So, whatever the gradient was, which is 3 over 2, minus 1 over that. Now, Again, this, I mean, we're, look, we're talking about the last question in the paper. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking here to, to the brighter students in set one. When you've got a fraction inside a fraction like this, when I put uh, that gradient into there, this is going to uh, effectively flip the fraction upside down. When you've got a fraction as a, inside a fraction, uh, particularly when, when, when it's one over that, then you turn the fraction upside down. So what I'm basically saying to you is this. If I put minus one over three over two, that is the same, the minus stays where it is, but to get rid of this fraction inside a fraction business, uh, you just turn the fraction upside down. So I've just worked out that the gradient of my new line is minus two thirds. All right, so uh, if I just sort of, so this was um, perpendicular gradient. So y equals minus two thirds uh, x plus something. Now again, I need to work out the new intercept because I'm, I'm trying to work out the equation of this new line. Now I know it passes through C, so I've got two coordinates that I know work on this line. So let's try those two in there. 2 equals minus 2 thirds of 5 plus something. Okay, um, so 2 equals minus 10 thirds plus something. Now, to get the something on its own, I'm going to add 10 thirds over here. Uh, so, 2 add 10 thirds equals C. Uh, you can't really add those two together until I've changed 2 into a fraction. So, 2 I can rewrite as 6 over 3. Yeah, 6 over 3 is the same as 2. So, if you write, rewrite that as 6 over 3, and I've got 10 over 3. 6 over 3, uh, 10 over 3 is 16 over 3. So, my answer then to this uh, question is the perpendicular line will have a gradient of minus two thirds and an intercept of positive 16 over 3. The only thing is, um, is that they want me to write it in a slightly different form uh, where A, B and C are integers. A, B and C. Um, Need to, it needs to look like this. Uh, sorry, it needs to look like that. Okay, so a b a x plus b y equals c, where a b and c are integers. So let's move the two third x onto this side. So if I add two thirds x over here uh, and do the same on this side, two third x, that will give me two thirds x plus y equals sixteen over three. And once again, they're still not integers, because as you should know, that's going to be a decimal, that's going to be a decimal. So now, to turn everything into an integer, if I just times everything through by 3, hopefully, this will give me a nice 
easy looking anyway answer 2x plus 3y equals 16 and that is the answer to the question okay so 2x plus 3y equals 16 so that now looks the way it's supposed to ax plus by plus c, uh, sorry equals c ax plus by equals c that is paper 1h uh, again, I can only say sorry for the length of the video, but hopefully you can skip ahead or back to the bits that you need. Thank you for listening.